Hello and Hare Krishna. Welcome to today's Chasing Reality podcast episode with me, Ramananda Das, aka Ryan. So we have two guests today. We're very fortunate. There will be um, Perry Marshall, who is author of the book Evolution 2.0, as well as a guest who has previously joined us, um, Professor Dennis Noble from the University of Oxford, um, whose latest book is Biological Relativity, Dance to the Tune of Life. Now, <clears throat> the reason I'm so excited about this call is, first of all, I've never had two guests on at once, so I'm unsure exactly how it's going to go in terms of the format, but I'm, I like to wing stuff, so let's see. Um, but the main reason is because they're both very, very interested in in something that I, I'm, I've i become quite fascinated with as well, which is the question of evolution in terms of um, organisms and the, and the physiology, the kind of physiology aspect. What is an organism? Um, is it is it controlled by its DNA or is an organism not reducible to its parts? Is it a whole? And what does that then mean? What is consciousness? What is information? So I'm going to ask some of these questions and uh, let's see how it goes. I need to meet you, Dennis and Perry. Um, I'm sure everyone listening knows who you are, um, but if for some reason they don't, um, Professor Dennis Noble, based in Oxford, um, and has written his recent book, um, Dance to the Tune of Life, Biological Relativity, and Perry Marshall, based in, actually, I, I realized, is it Chicago, Perry? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, and, and you may know his book, Evolution 2.0. Um, and we're going to focus on some some questions tonight about mainly about evolution theory, I think, is where it's going to end up on organisms and physiology. So first of all, I just thought I'd ask, um, Perry, I understand you come from a communications engineering background. And, yes. And physiology. So how do you how did you both get in touch? How do you know each other? Well, I went to Dennis's meeting that he organized in 2016. Um, and actually, a friend had introduced us by email earlier, but, well, you know how email is. You know, it's some person far away. But when I, I went to the Royal Society meeting in November 2016, and um, it was really the, the first time that the dissenters from st the standard neo-Darwinian you know, banging that drum. Mm -hmm. um, the, it was the first time the dissenters had center stage in a major scientific venue. Up to that point, uh, most of that kind of stuff had been relegated to minor journals and minor conferences, and it, it wasn't center stage, but this, this brought it to the fore. And so it was, uh, it was thrilling to be there. It felt very historic, especially, especially once the meeting found its groove. I'd say it took a day or so for the meeting to really kind of hit a resonance, but then it did, and it was fantastic. And I thought, well, I felt like Forrest Gump, you know, the guy who like shows up at all these historic events almost by accident. Um, and, uh, and I introduced myself to Dennis and I told him, Hey, I've got this technology prize. Um, when I c go back home, could we find a time to talk about this? And, and he was willing, and that's been a very, very big deal in the evolution 2.0 project. So, um, it, what a, what a great way to, to meet Dennis. <laughs> Thank you very much, Perry. Um, maybe I could ask you, Dennis, um, Perry mentioned about, I heard two words, dissenters and neo-Darwinism. Um, so, so perhaps you could um, explain a little bit about what, what the words actually Me. mean. Yeah. Great. Yes, I'd be very happy to do that. Um, the way I look at it, excuse me, you'll have to cut this bit out. I've got a, <coughs> one of my nose problems. Right, I think that's okay now. Yes, I'm very happy to try to clarify uh, what's meant here by neo-Darwinism and what is meant by dissenting from it. Charles Darwin is well known, of course, for having formulated the idea of natural selection, that 
once there is variation amongst organisms, animals, plants, or whatever it might be, and humans, of course, that some survive better than others, and therefore they carry their inheritance to their children and grandchildren and so on. And so slowly, ever so slowly, that can give rise to changes in the population of those particular animals or plants, or they could even, of course, be um, very tiny microorganisms too. Now, the idea in neo-Darwinism is that that is all there is. There's just that random damage or variation, sometimes positive, often negative, in the inherited material, and then natural selection. It gives no possibility to organisms to themselves influence the direction in which evolution occurs. In other words, it removes human or indeed other organism agency, the wish to do X rather than Y. Now, Darwin was very puzzled by this, actually. He was not a neo-Darwinist, and he realized there were other processes in addition to that. In particular, he realized that when, as humans, we decide who we're going to marry, who we're going to raise children with, we are ourselves making a difference to the direction in which evolution occurs, because those we choose are those that will be the ones that will pass their genetic composition on to the progeny. So he already knew way back in the middle of the 19th century that it could not be just a matter of chance variation in the inherited material followed by natural selection. There is also what you might call artificial selection, that is the agency of organisms. Now, why does that matter? It matters because if you think that we as humans and other animals, the dog, the cat, the fish, or whatever, have agency, you've got one view of humanity and of other organisms, which is that we are responsible, we are free agents. On the other view, we're not really. We are just simply the passive recipients of whatever happens. That's the fundamental difference, and that has implications for all walks of life be it economics, theology, sociology, uh, even literature. So it has very wide implications, even though it might seem initially to be quite a small issue to do in a rather recondite way with the theory of evolution. Okay. Absolutely. absolutely. And, and um, the way this came up for me was I, I, I got in an argument with my younger brother, who's very, very smart guy. And, um, and we, we got into this question and he says, he says, listen, Perry, if um, now, by the way, at this point, I had never studied evolution. I didn't really know that much about it. Um, I didn't particularly have anything against it, but my brother phrased the question in a very particular way. Um, he said, listen, Perry, let's say that there's um, a billion falcons flying around for 10 million years, um, he goes, Perry, that's a lot of falcons. And let's say that there's an occasional copying error in DNA and it makes them see better instead of worse, then the better falcons are going to out hunt the other ones and the falcons get better. And you don't need any agency. You don't need any designer. You don't need anything like that. It, it just happens. And I listened to that and I thought, okay, I don't, that doesn't sound right to me, but I know there's a whole bunch of biologists that would probably agree with him. And I'm going to go find out. And, and to me, the implication was if all you need is an occasional copying error and, uh, and a bunch of replicating creatures and everything's just going to get better and better and better, then maybe maybe I've been under an illusion all of my life that when I looked at the hand at the end of my arm and I saw a really nice piece of engineering and I'm a communication engineer and I've been building stuff all my life. 
and and I've laid awake at night new, innumerable times trying to figure out, well, how am I going to put that together? You know, how are we going to how are we going to solve this problem? It's like if if nature solves its problems through a blind, purposeless process where there's no agency whatsoever, then that like turns my whole conception of the world upside down. And it really does have very deep tentacles. It reaches into everything. It reaches into literature and engineering and social policy and economics and, and everything that you can imagine. And I was suddenly extraordinarily interested in this question because I felt like if I could get to the bottom of this question that I would... Um, I would really be at the bottom of a very significant philosophical question in the whole world. Like, is the world a purposeful place or is the world a purposeless place? And there's an awful lot of people who think the world is a purposeless place. And we just, well, us, you know, conscious human beings, we just kind of impose our own purposes on top of it, but it it has none of its own. Well, even, even for questions like the environment, and how we treat the earth are hugely impacted by is nature just a uh, an accumulation of blind accidents or is nature a purposeful thing i i, I would go so far as to say that because um, tens of thousands of scientists for about a hundred years have been telling their students that nature is blind and purposeless that's one of the reasons we're in the ecological mess that we're in right now. Um, and, and so this is an incredibly important question. And so I came to it as a communication engineer. I said, well, I'm not a biologist, but um, I do know how to read a scientific paper. And I am, I understand physics and I understand chemistry and I understand how to read scientific literature. So let's get busy with this thing. And well, it looks like I ended up with a lot of books. <laughs> Indeed, you have. <laughs> so it, it sounds to me from, from what I've heard both of you say is that the theory of evolution, you're not questioning the theory of evolution. What you're questioning is there's, there's this concept of chance, um, a, a concepts of natural selection and the concept of chance. And it sounds to me like that is what's being questioned, whether something is purposeless or whether actually there is purposiveness in nature. And you you, you it sounds like there's a revival of that concept because I understand that that is something historically which has existed. Um, and so what's different now? In uh, my, my understanding is that through history, we've seen three main groups, the mechanists, organicists, and vitalists. And I'm putting them on the broad, the broad name. I'm sure there are many subtleties. Um, is this a revival of a certain genre? Or, or what, what are we seeing here? I'm, I'm, I'm interested in hearing. I call them the stochasticists. I've just invented a word. <laughs> oh, great. <It's> great. <laughs> <laughs> because actually my, my paper at the Royal Society meeting three years ago was precisely on that, how organisms harness chance. You see, I think the neo-Darwinists don't give enough attention to the role of chance. Yes, there is chance variation on which natural selection can then play its part, but we also use chance. We do it in many different systems in our body. We do it in our immune system all the time. The way the immune system finds an answer to a new virus that invades us or a new bacterium that is not encountered by before is to go down to the molecular level and actually use molecular change in the DNA to get an answer to the problem. I think we do the same thing with our brains. We use the chance which we know as neuroscientists is there in the way in which individual nerves in our brains go this way or that way, flip up or down in a stochastic, that is a chancy way. So I would say it isn't returning to vitalism as it was once thought of, or the other possible option you gave us, um, but it's not returning to the determinists either. On the contrary, 
because we as organisms are capable of harnessing chance, that is using it, we are capable of novelty, of creativity. Where did Beethoven suddenly get the idea that he would totally transform music? Where did Dostoevsky get a sudden idea that he would create a totally new kind of novel? Where did Maynard Keynes get his idea that he would suddenly transform and turn economics upside down? That's human creativity. And you either think that is important or you think, well, what do you think? You think that somehow or other they were determined by some determinate process to do those creative things. It makes a huge difference to the way in which you appreciate that kind of human creativity or indeed the creativity in, in a dog or a cattle or whatever it might be. Uh, fighting for its life in the wild or whatever it might be doing. So I would say that the problem arises that the neo-Darwinists have not actually appreciated that there's much more to stochasticity, to chance variations, than just the fact that we experience it. We actually use it. Now you can go even further, because I think the person who introduced me to... Um, uh, Perry Marshall was Jim Shapiro. Mm. And what he's shown is something that one of his mentors, a lady called Barbara McClintock, showed many years ago, that not only can organisms harness stochasticity, they can actually change their genomes. That is dynamite. That's what you're not supposed to be able to do. They're not supposed on the modern synthesis or neo-Darwinism is called to be able to do that. Organisms demonstrably can do it. And there's an engineering version of this too. So my, um, uh, my degree is in electrical engineering and I studied communication systems and control systems. So control systems is things like the cruise control on your car or uh, the, the guidance system on an airplane or a missile. And um, if, if, you're, if you're flying an airplane from London to Paris and you have um, autopilot on the plane, which of course most of the planes are flown by computers now, what you have there is called a stochastic control system. Mm. And this is a very, very, very well-developed field of engineering theory that's been in existence for about 80 or 100 years. And it is the study of getting where you're trying to go in the face of all kinds of random, like you don't know which way the wind is going to be blowing and you don't know if there's a hurricane somewhere or if it's going to be raining. There's all of these things, but the, the plane has to stay on course. And wh when I came into the whole field of evolution, I found a great deal of incredibly sloppy language. I found that the words like random and the wor words like stochastic were just thrown around by people who rarely bothered to stop and define what they meant. Um, random in biology literature probably means six or eight completely different things depending on who you're reading and what they're saying. And this led to just this, um, frankly, um, so, some of the literature was just junk science. Um, you know, Jerry Coyne's book, Why Evolution is True, at a certain level is a great book. It does a great job of explaining evidence for evolution, and um, it, it kind of gives you a very nice overview of the whole topic, but um, it makes a critical mistake and a critical omission. Um, a critical mistake is, uh, Coyne says that all of the evolutionary va variations come from uh, random copying errors and mutations that are, in his words, willy-nilly. <laughs> okay, willy nilly. That is the word that he used, which synonym would be random. Okay, like there's no direction or purpose to it, to any of it. He does not, not once in his book, he never talks about the systematic mechanisms of evolution, 
where organisms actually control their own genetics, like transposition or epigenetics or horizontal gene transfer or uh, symbiotic mergers of organisms or hybridizations where two organisms are merged together. He doesn't talk about um, how organisms literally steal code from viruses and use it for their own purposes. And what this means is that any, every living thing on earth is a stochastic control system having a level of sophistication far beyond any plane that Boeing ever built. And, and Jerry's book was really essentially a tract for atheism. And look, I make my living in marketing, and I can smell propaganda a mile away, okay? I mean, I live in the world where people, you know, build, you know, build sales pitches and, and, and marketing and all that. It's like, this guy is doing a really good job of marketing atheism, um, but he's not telling you any of the most interesting stuff in biology. He's rehashing the stuff that everybody already knows. And so, and so I, was, I became very disturbed at how propagandized the whole field had become. Now, um, Dennis, um, I was listening to Dennis, uh, um, well, I was listening to his interview with you, as a matter of fact, and Dennis said, he said, I've spent a lot of time in the Midwestern United States with regular, ordinary, hardworking, uh, you know, Protestant work ethic kind of Americans, and there's very strong belief in creationism. And that's exactly where I come from. I mean, I grew up in a basically a fundamentalist right-wing Christian church in Lincoln, Nebraska, right, point, right in the middle of the Midwest. And where I come from, everybody was horrified by Darwinism. Well, for one thing, it was, a, it was associated with genocide and the Nazis and Stalin and all of that, which is all true, by the way. Like, that's, that's not like that's made up. It's, it's all Sadly so, yes. Right. And, and um, you know, people like that are very skeptical of these explanations that, oh, you know, it's, it's all you need is billiard balls banging around in the universe long enough. And eventually, you know, you're going to, you're going to get from molecules to man. And as an engineer, this just didn't make sense to me. And so, so now I grew up again in the super, like, I remember when the guy came to our church and spent a whole week explaining why the earth was 6,000 years old and all of the geology of the earth was from a big giant flood. I mean, I grew up in that. Well, they're both ridiculous. Okay. I'm still a Christian, but I, I, I'd be the last guy to ever suggest that all of the geology of the earth came from Noah's flood. Okay. That's absurd. But so is the idea that molecules to man and uh, by random accident and natural selection is all you need to know. Like that's, that's just ab as absurd. And what I found in the middle with people like uh, James Shapiro and Ava Yablanka and Lynn Margulis and Dennis's work and all these different people at Dennis's conference was the real story was infinitely more interesting than anything those two sides were arguing about. And, you know, you could um, you could summarize like the whole American scene of of evolution in the Bill Nye versus Ken Ham debate that they had about seven years ago, and it was like there was all this publicity around it. And these these guys get on YouTube, and basically they just conk each other on the head for an hour and a half, completely talk past each other. Neither one of them really said anything interesting, and all of like all of the real science was just completely steamrolled in this ridiculous conversation. And, and what I think Dennis's meeting at the Royal Society did was it said, hey, we're going to take, we got, we got a, a 75 years of literature where people have been meticulously dissecting the mechanisms by which these evolutionary changes happen. And we're going to roll them out. We're going to put front stage and, and, and we're going we're gonna to make sure that it, it is very clear that um, a whole different picture of evolution has emerged over the last um, particularly 10 or 20 years. And like I, 
I have never ceased to be um, amazed and obsessed with the sophistication with which living things do their work. So it, it, to me, it sounds like you're, you're very much into, or both of you are very much interested in, um, in making sure that, that the science itself comes to the forefront, not necessarily certain um, uh, ways of thinking, certain philosophical frameworks, for example, that, that everything is, can be, evolution could be explained completely by chance and without purposive behavior. I, I'd like to ask you both a question. It's, it's something I think would be very fitting and I've been itching to ask someone it for a while because I'm, I'm trained as a biologist and, and I've, as I thought about it more and more, I struggle actually, I really struggle with something and I'm hoping to get some help. Um, in my mind, I've got evolution, which is um, a process that can occur, uh, you know, o over time. And I've got organisms and the questions seem like different ones to be in a sense. So I, I'm asking myself, what is an organism? What actually is an organism? Um, where do purposes come from? What, what actually is, you know, controlling behavior and, and phenotypes? And then evolution seems like another thing that can happen. Um, and, I, and I'll give you an example, but the specific question I have. Um, we start with a single cell, a, a few, you know, fused egg and sperm. I can't get, I just can't wrap my head around where the information comes from that everything happens so perfectly that my arms are the same length. Where is, and Lewis Wolpert famously quoted this as, as, a, as a mystery. Um, where in space and time, how does this happen? Um, so I guess this is more of a physiological <laughs> question, but maybe there's evolutionary aspects to it that I don't understand. So if any of you have any points on that, and I think it gets into information, I would I'd very much appreciate it. Do you want to start with that, Dennis? I'll do my best. Yes, that's a very big question. Oh, and I've got used to the fact that Ryan uh, really puts people right on the spot. And this one certainly does for a physiologist. Because to rephrase your question, how much of all of that could be said to be programmed which is the word people tend to use in one's DNA, and therefore one can't do much about it. The fact just is that there's a program there for building the house or building the organism, and it just rolls itself out. The alternative view is that there's a considerable degree of what we would call plasticity, of elasticity in what could happen from the same genome. Now, one way to look at that is to ask a very simple question. Look at what happens to identical twins. Now, the reason I suggest that as a way of approaching this question is that identical twins, if they're really identical, have essentially the same genome. They've arisen because the egg has divided before it's got to the point at which an organism is beginning to develop. So you get two or even three or even four, uh, depending on how many divisions occur before uh, what we call differentiation, that is the development towards the adult begins. Mm -hmm. Now, so you get two identical twins, and let's imagine the following experiment, that one of them trains as a weightlifter and the other trains as a long distance runner. Actually, this is not an imaginary experiment. It was done about 70 years ago when some physiologists investigated two identical twins that did precisely that. Now, you can guess what happened. The runner, had extraordinary <coughs> leg muscles and a very light top, chest, arms, and so on, quite light, because after all, that makes it far easier to carry the weight with those running legs. The weightlifter, who, remember, started off with the same genome, was enormously tough in the upper part of his body. Of course, his legs had to be strong enough to 
be able to carry the whole body and whatever weight lifts he had to do. Now, we now know how that happens. It happens because that decision by the weightlifter or the runner to do what they decided to do, their lifestyle changes. Now I'm going to use some technical language, but I'll then try to make it more um, clear to a lay audience. It changes the RNAs. And it's important here to know that RNAs are not DNA. It's a different type of nucleic acid. The important thing about it is this. It's through those that we as organisms regulate and control our genomes. So causation goes the different way from what is supposed by the program idea. It isn't that you start with the genome and everything follows from that. It is also the case that the organism, through the decisions it makes, and we're now back to agency notice, mm -hmm controls what genes are expressed, how much they're expressed. So I would answer your question by saying, we can't say yet in great detail how the development occurs from that egg through to the adult in the kind of detail that you'd love to hear. But in the cases where we can give the mechanism, we can do it right down to a very detailed way. I'll give one other example, and then hand over to Perry to see his comments on this. Athletes can do something else that's very important. They can slow their heart rates. That is also mediated by RNAs influencing a expression of a gene that creates a protein that is used to make a protein that controls heart rhythm. Again, the decision by the athlete to be an athlete and to train as an athlete has an effect right down at the molecular level of control of the genome. I've given two examples of that. I'm sure that as our scientific understanding of the relationship between the organism as a whole and its genome develops further, as the field of epigenetics explodes in the future, we will find many more. But we already have detailed examples where you can show right down at the molecular level where the control is exerted over the genome. Excellent. So I think that all of your, the question that you're asking, Ryan, it comes down to the central question of biology and philosophy and civilization and technology and AI. And it's the question of choice. Yeah. If you go to the store and you buy a one megabyte USB stick, that USB stick contain, it has a capacity for 1 million bytes. So I guess that's 8 million choices a one or a zero every single one of those is it a one or is it a zero is it a one or is it a zero now if you can illustrate this real easily I, I wish I could like put my cell phone on the screen but we all we all know how this works if I if I start to text you Ryan on my cell phone the cell phone gives me three choices of what it thinks the next word might be right with the auto suggest mm -hmm. now if if we made a if we played a little game and and the, and the game was okay you can type the first word and every word after that you have to choose between the choices it gives you you'll actually find if you try it you can make a pretty sensible reasonable sentence and it sounds like real english and you can actually do it for quite a long time and you'll be fine and all you have to do is choose between three words that it gives you and you can actually make, you can make English. So, so the algorithm in the phone is completely deterministic, but your choice is moving things along and then you can create language. Hmm. Now, on the other hand, 
if you just picked the first word it gave you or you just picked them at random, you'd get gibberish. You'd get just because algorithm, alg, algorithms can't do English. Um, they're trying really hard, but believe me, like, again, I'm in online advertising and they're Google and Facebook are spending billions of dollars on this stuff and they can't figure out how to do it. Well, the reason they can't do it is there's no way they don't know how to make a computer that actually makes choices. All a computer can do is obey rules. Well, all of language, all of civilization and all of biology is choices in response to those, these stochastic inputs that come at us. And that is how life is made. And so I think the central question in biology, the central question in evolution, the central question of civilization and morality even is choice. And I think the reason that organisms are that way is because at some level, they have chosen to be that way, which I realize that's kind of trippy. That's like the MC Escher painting where the hand is drawing a hand. You ever seen that one? No, I haven't. Well, you, you can find it. Uh, go, go to Google and type in hand drawing hand MC Escher and you'll, 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 it's, it's a real famous picture. Um, I think it's, it's like life in, uh, in a sense, at least, creates itself. And there's a word for this. It's autopoesis. It was one of Lynn Margulis's favorite terms. Um, and, and see, I, I think that the creationists have declared evolution as a hoax. And the Darwinists have declared that evolution is random. In fact, it is far, far deeper and more sophisticated than any of those people ever imagined. And, and I think, um, well, I th as an engineer, I think most biologists just take evolution for granted. But as an engineer who, tr who builds things, like, I don't take any of it for granted. The, f the fact that a bacteria can develop resistance to antibiotics in 30 minutes, that's astounding. How, how does it do it? Um, on my website, I say if, if Microsoft knew what one bacteria knows, their stock price would go up 10x overnight. So what, what do those little suckers know that we don't? Well, I don't know. Well, we do know, actually, Perry. They know, they know how to target a very specific part of their genomes and vary just that. Yes. Stopping the error correction mechanism. I'm getting a bit technical again, Ryan. I'm sorry. But sometimes, you know, even talking with the general audience, I think you mustn't dumb down. Mm -hmm. We do know the mechanism by which those bacteria succeed in doing it, and it is extremely clever because it's only a very tiny bit of the genome that they, they make it spin, as it were, through many possible variations. It's yeah. quite remarkable. And how do you describe that? By exactly what I was describing earlier on, harnessing stochasticity, controlling chance. That's the key. Mm -hmm. This brings me to a, I think we're coming to the, 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 um, the C question. Um, the consciousness question, because it's the obvious thing. You've you've both been bringing up the question, the, the point about um, choices, purposes. The obvious question that arises in my mind, and probably many people's at this point, is: It seems that even though I am organisms, don't know how we are driving physical things to manifest. I I do have certain agency, and and I don't know how things manifest. It's like it just happens somehow, or it doesn't happen. So. What is it? Am I right in thinking your consciousness is, is, is an important aspect of this? And, and how would you integrate it? What do you think, Dennis? He's asking the big one, isn't he? This one gets even bigger than the last one. <laughs> um, now, a, a, a cop out way would be to say, Ryan, you've got another program if you want to deal with that one. <laughs> oh, <that's fine> <laughs> but, but nevertheless, let, let's just have a go. I don't know the answer to the question how it comes about that we as water-based uh, molecular systems 
can be conscious of what it is that we choose to do. But I think you're right to indicate that choice and consciousness must have part of the same kind of explanation. But I think, as a biologist anyway, and what Perry would think as an engineer, I think we're still feeling our way forward on this kind of issue. What is precisely the connection between giving agency to organisms, which clearly I think we need to do, and we now know the stochastic mechanisms that make that possible, and the question, why is it that we are aware of what we choose to do? And I think they're connected. And that's as far as I could take it at the moment. Yeah, I would, I would go along with what Dennis said. I think let's, let's make a distinction between two terms, consciousness and agency, okay? And agency being a more generalized term, which is saying that um, this system is taking care of itself where consciousness comes with a lot of connotations and baggage, right? Like when you say consciousness, most of us think in terms of, well, I'm talking to you two guys and you guys are talking to me and I'm having an experience inside of my head and you're having an experience in your head. And we call that consciousness, you know, is, is a bacteria conscious? I don't know. Um, is a goldfish conscious? I don't know. Um, there's, I would imagine that there's a huge different set of levels of, of consciousness. But I feel pretty comfortable in saying that living things have agency and nothing that is non-living has agency. Computers don't have agency. Cars don't have agency. Babbling brooks don't have agency. Rocks in the desert don't have agency, but living things do. And as a communication engineer, the only way I've ever seen information get created is through systems that do have agency. So in other words, information as formally defined, and I define it in, in my prize specification, information only comes from biology. It doesn't come from physics or chemistry. And um, there's, a, there's a chemist that I know named Addy Pross. He calls it the black hole in, in physics and chemistry as to how do you get from laws of physics, laws of chemistry, which are all, I think, very well understood, to what biology does. And I think this question makes people very uncomfortable because we just don't know. And then if you go, if you go down the consciousness rabbit hole, nobody really has any idea what it is. Like we, we experience what it is, but we can't like, we can't define it in a scientific way. Like nobody, it's, it's a very strange set of circumstances that we all have this experience, but we can't, we can't define it. You know what it's like? It's kind of like the fact that everybody knows what life is, but if you ask a hundred biologists to define life, every single one of them will give you a different definition than the next person, than the next person. And so these things right now in our current level of understanding are almost ineffable. ineffable. And it, it makes a lot of people really uncomfortable. And so they just, they just don't want to talk about it. Sure. You brought up a, a point there, and I think it leads on nicely to, to, to the next section, which is to do with the prize. So it's, 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 a, it's a whopping prize that you're, you're offering of, of $10 million. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe, maybe you, you, you could both tell, t tell the audience about what it is that, that's up for grabs. <laughs> so the, the Evolution Prize came about because this discussion about where life came from seemed to fall into two ditches. One ditch was, well, it was a happy chemical accident. There was a lucky lightning strike and some 
some RNA strands got going by some ocean vents and it turned into a cell and like you'd get this story, okay, which is very pieced together, very fragmented, very incomplete and well, yeah, uh, not, not really that well supported by solid evidence, okay? And, and then you'd have, well, well God did it. <laughs> and, um, you know, coming from the background I came from, I was inclined to be content with the God did it answer. It's like, well, at least if we think God made life, and if, at least if we believe that life is intrinsically purposeful and divinely ordered, then hopefully, you know, hopefully we're not going to create another Holocaust. So that's good. You know, th so, so, you know, the, up to a point, I, I kind of like that answer. But over time, I came to realize, like, you know, that Perry, uh, there isn't a working scientist in the world that can write God did it in a scientific paper and say, well, that settles it. Let's go out to lunch. You know, like, it's not, it's not a productive, immediately, technically, scientifically useful answer. It's only an ultimate explanation that's kind of like a million miles away. And, and so I, I got to thinking, well, what if you could actually solve this? And um, I don't know if we want to go into the whole story of, uh, you know, how, you know, one thing led to another, but, but I came to realize when you, when you put money on the table and you, and you say, what would happen if we solved this? What would it mean to the world if somebody solved this problem? And, um, and so what we're looking for is how do you get code? Now, Dennis has this great saying that there is no privileged level of causation in biology, that it's systems within systems within systems. Well, there's a very interesting thing about any code anywhere. Code is only code in a context of encoding and decoding. Okay, if, if I take your hard drive and I get an electron microscope and I look at a few, you know, bits in, 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 your, in your hard drive, those bits don't mean anything to that microscope. It's like, oh, there's a one, there's a zero. So what? It, at that level, it's just bits of ferrite, okay? Or whatever material that, that your stuff is made out of, okay? But in the context of what is, of what is read and what is written by the system, only then does it have meaning. So in a certain context, 100001 is A and 100010 is B. So, in order to have code, you have to have encoder, message, and decoder. And this is exactly what you have in cell replication. You have transcription and translation. The, the, the DNA code is, is, trans, uh, is transcribed into RNA, and it's translated into amino acids. That is encoding and decoding. And so, we said, if you can make an encoder, a message, and a decoder emerge through some emergent property or some law of physics or however you can get it to happen, then if you, if we'll buy the patent, we'll pay for the patent process and we'll buy the patent from you for $10 million. And I think this is, it's just like that conversation about choice that we were having 10 minutes ago. We're looking for the physical roots of where choice comes from. Because if you can make some kind of a chemical system that makes choices and assigns symbolic meanings to things, you've created some form of intelligence. You've probably solved the origin of life. Um, and you've, and you might even solve consciousness like all at once. And, and so we thought that's worth a lot of money. So I went to a bunch of investors and I raised money and, and here we are. I have only one thing to add to what Perry has said. I'm one of the judges with, at the moment, two other very distinguished people, one a geneticist, the other a philosopher. 
I have a kind of bet with Perry, which is that I don't think the prize can be won. I'll, I'll revise that bet slightly, Perry, which is I don't think it can be won in my lifetime. <laughs> but I think with that throwaway remark, which I agree is a little bit of a funny quip at the end, that's about as far as I can go in adding to what you said. Well, I just think it's it's so fundamental and we need to focus more attention on it. Um, everybody talks about the chemistry of biology, but the information in biology receives a lot less attention. And it's pretty apparent to me that the information controls the chemistry more than the chemistry controls the information. Exactly. And that's a, that is a whole entire conceptual, it really turns the whole evolutionary picture upside down. If it's information first, chemical second, or if it's even consciousness first, information second, chemicals third, or, or if those three things are in a triad where they are mutually dependent and they can't be separated from each other, then you have a whole different conundrum that generally hasn't been properly recognized in 150 years of people arguing about this. And one thing I know is that, is that questions are more powerful than answers. There is, there is something so powerful. If a question burns a hole in your brain for 20 years, and then all of a sudden, woo, like, you know, I don't know, maybe you're swimming at the beach or maybe you're pushing your kid on a swing or whatever. And all of a sudden that answer shows up you know, or the, the fifth symphony somehow makes its way into Beethoven's brain. Like, I don't know how that happens, but a question is an incredibly powerful thing. And so I'm, I, I've never talked to a scientist who has any real idea how we're going to solve this, <laughs> but, but there's clues. Um, there's a podcast coming out um, sometime in the next few weeks from evolution 2.0, where um, I set uh, I sat down with a gentleman and we, and, and he asked me, he said, well, wh what do you think are some clues of where we might go looking um, to find an answer to this? And I, I came up with about 10 different doors that we could go look behind. You know, one of them might be some less publicized properties of water. Um, some of it is consciousness. There's, there's some other things. So I don't know, but you know, let's, let's get to looking. Um, let's, let's see what we can do. Thank you. I, I'm, it's, it's a very ambitious um, project and I, I, it's very exciting. I remember listening to one scientist, um, one of his audio books some time ago, and he was saying how prizes have always been something that have really helped things to move forwards actually in, in in science and so it's it's lovely to see that this i mean a big prize for a big question <laughs> yeah we need we need a lot of those um and hopefully we'll be able to come up with more prizes in the future but um but yeah, i i love i love in unanswered questions i'm not uncomfortable with mystery i think i think all human beings need to be more comfortable in our skin with things that we don't know the answer to. The world is far more amazing than we can even imagine. And, and I don't, I don't think you, I don't think you feel the sense of wonder unless you allow yourself to feel the magnitude of these questions. I, I think it, I think it gives you more gratitude. I think it's also empowering. I, I think, I think the notion that we're all a result of billiard balls banging around in the universe, deterministic processes and natural selection, that is one of the most disempowering ways of thinking about life that I can imagine. Um, you know, what, we're, we're, we're just lumbering robots driven by our genes? What, you gonna tell that to a guy who has an addiction? Right. Like, come on. Like, people need hope. And choice is hope. Very nice. With that, I entirely agree. 
Um, and I think that's uh, why the challenge is so big and why I'm very happy to be on the committee that is to judge this prize. And as I heard earlier in what Perry was saying, uh, formulating important questions is by far the biggest challenge in science. The question is formulated at the least. Yeah, yeah it is. Well, thank you both. I think that's a lovely, lovely place to, to draw it to a close. Um, and I hope to speak to you both in the future. One, one thing maybe just to, from, from each of you before we um, part is anything you might want to say to budding scientists or um, thinkers out there um, as, as any words of encouragement? I would say very simply that the view of evolution that we have been discussing opens up a vast number of possible very important scientific projects. So to young scientists coming into uh, ask the question, has everything been done? Have we understood the whole process? The answer is no, not by a long way. There are many very good things that could be done. And we look forward to seeing young scientists take up that challenge. Yeah, my, my advice would be is that the majority is usually wrong. And almost all industries are reformed by outsiders. Charles Darwin was an outsider. Okay. He was not like part of the establishment. In fact, uh, you know, he was like a guy studying for the ministry or something. And he happened to go on a boat trip to the Galapagos islands. Okay. Darwin was an outsider. Bill Gates was not an insider in the mainframe computer industry. And Larry and Sergey were not insiders in the search engine game. And Steve Jobs was not an insider in the computer game. And, and Ray Kroc was not an insider in the restaurant business. Um, all, almost all innovations come from the outside. And they are almost always opposed by the people that are on the inside. That's just the way it is. And so what a young scientist really has to do is get good at discerning. What do I leave alone because it's good? And what do I challenge because it needs to be challenged? Um, and there's no way we can go into a dissertation any further about how you do that. But that is the question. What is solid and reliable and doesn't need to be questioned? And what, like, what do we need to take a machete to? And, um, it, and if you can understand that if you're taking a machete to cherished but highly questionable assumptions, then you will, be, by definition, be an outsider. And that is a gift. And you need to go into that with courage uh, you need to assume that they're not going to embrace you with loving arms and give you a big, wet, sloppy kiss. Um, the, the old guard was not very happy about Dennis Noble, outsider, physiologist, coming into evolutionary theory going, I know that I know that I know from the cardiac rhythm that your model of genes is incorrect. And I'm going to start with what I know and I'm going to work my way back and, you know, and there's going to be no sacred cows. Um, they did not, they were not happy about that, but, but that, that is the path of the innovator. And um, they, they may not thank you quickly and early, but the, that eventually becomes the kind of people they build statues and they honor them you know, a century later as visionaries and, and world changers. So speak your convictions. Thank you very much, both of you, for your time and your inspiration and um, your hope-filled messages. It's very encouraging. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, I hope people will, um, will, will go to evo2.org. Uh, we have a, a podcast you can subscribe to. We've got uh, videos you can look at. Um, you can you can you can watch the video uh, that Dennis and I did at the Royal Society announcing the 
the prize and, uh, you know, crack open a book and like there's, there's a whole world of discoveries just and waiting to be found. So thanks for having me on today. This has been great. Thank you both. I appreciate it. And hopefully I can get you back in the future somehow. <laughs> yeah, you bet. Okay. Have a good afternoon stroke evening. Okay. Thank you, Ryan. <laughs> thank you very much. Good interview. Appreciate it. Take care. Yeah. Okay. So thank you very much for joining me with this wonderful podcast with uh, Perry Marshall and uh, Dennis Noble. So what did I take away? I took many things away. It was actually, it was actually fascinating. And the dynamic between us was very interesting. I didn't know if it would work having three people, but I was really impressed. Um, I'll have to remember that structure for next time. The way I think it ended up working is I was asking a particular question and both of them would give their, um, give their replies. And you almost got this kind of synergistic um, thing that came out. So my understanding of what they were both saying, I think they're both kind of aligned, is that evolution isn't, well, first of all, it was quite clear they both um, believe in, in evolution and that evolution is, is the best theory to explain um, life. And I understood they were saying that um, it's, evolution is not a simple thing. Organisms are not simple things. You can't just um, talk about genes and say that we're, um, we can explain organisms that way. It requires the input of um, information. And the question is, what is information? And how can we study that? And that, this is why Perry went on to talk about his $10 million prize that he's putting up um, for anyone who can answer this, or at least attempt to answer this, this question about what is life. So let's see how it goes. And hopefully I can get them on for another podcast in the future. <laughs>